Good evening. On behalf of superheroes everywhere, oh, and super heroines, or super persons if you prefer, I bid you welcome. Now that I have your attention, we'll proceed. Welcome to Now Playing's DC Comics Team Up Retrospective Series. He calls my arrival the dawn of the superhero. I am not sure if I know what that means. Continuing our look at movies based on DC Comics characters, Arnie, Stewart, and Jacob will be reviewing Legends of the Superheroes. Ladies and gentlemen, the world's mightiest mortal. Justice League of America. We all need heroes in our lives. Sometimes we find them in the most unlikely places. Gen 13. Once the students become Gen Active, no one will be able to stop us. Not Lynch, not the government. The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. League of what? There have been other times when a danger upon the world required the services of singular individuals. And Watchmen. And all the whores and politicians will look up and shout, Save us. And all the whisper, No. This podcast will contain detailed plot spoilers and mild language. That was naughty. Listener discretion is advised. Sounds cool. I kind of like the superhero stuff. It'll be just like, like a super friend. Today we're discussing the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. LXG. Yeah, get it right, man. It's all <laughs> hip and shit. Starring Sean Connery. And a bunch of white dudes that no one ever saw again. Nasserudin Shah. Peta Wilson. Huh? Not from the Hunger Games. <laughs> Tony Kerr and Stuart Townsend. Directed by Stephen Norrington. Blades Stephen Norrington. <laughs> <laughs> wow. This is Arnie, co-host of Now Playing, and I'm here with my own League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Stuart in LA. And this is Jacob, the immortal sir, not a gazelle. Back to DC teams, back to Alan Moore. We're actually polishing off uh, the rest of his movie adaptations. Cursing us. I feel him praying to his snake god, cursing us right now <laughs> for even discussing it. Constantine, V for Vendetta. We did some Swamp Thing. We haven't worked in From Hell. I thought that was DC, but no, huh? No, that's actually... I believe Top Shelf, who is currently publishing The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. This was originally on America's Best Comics, which was an imprint of DC. It was like, we got Alan Moore. Let's let him do whatever he wants. So he had like Tom Strong and Top Ten, all these kind of like throwback ideas. And The League was one of them. He did three volumes with America's Best. And then he had his fallout with DC. And now he's with Top Shelf, who did From Hell. And he's done... Another trade paperback of the League, plus a Nemo trilogy starring Nemo's daughter. Yeah, I read Alan Moore's wiki article, and it's great to read as to why he left DC. Like, they promised him he could do whatever he wanted, no interference, but then... And interfered. <laughs> when he included Marvel Douche as a douche <laughs> product in the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, they went, no, you can't do that. And it changed, and then other pokings at different companies. Yeah, it, it should be said, if you, if you read those comics, what you're talking about with Marvel douche, it's not a character. He would do these Victorian ads. And uh, he, he really grasped onto, like, the sexuality of the Victorian era. We think of it so repressed, but they were actually very sexually liberated, and he really plays that up, especially in The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, when you, like, have the Invisible Man as the Holy Spirit knocking up Catholic girls in a boarding school. So, Jacob, have you read this one? Because I have read many Alan Moore, but this one I've never picked up a comic for. Yeah, I've read all of the League stuff. I, I would say strong recommend for volumes one and two, as well as the Black Dossier. Century, look, if you want to see Mary Poppins fight Harry Potter, I, I guess that's your thing. <laughs> it, it didn't do a whole lot for me. I might. Can I say I might a maybe on that one? My big problem with that is, look you got to know your literature mm. and pop culture. Like, this, the whole world of the League is like, what if everything in pop culture and literature, like, existed in a world? 
And so he gets into some very obscure references in Century, which is why it kind of lost me. But when he came back with that Nemo trilogy, I was really into that. Like he had Captain Nemo's daughter taking on the uh, Charlie Chaplin's great dictator version of Hitler with, you know, <laughs> robots from Metropolis. It was great. Uh, if you get the references, they're fun. When he gets real obscure, they kind of lose the fun. I understand there are websites dedicated to annotating these because every panel has some obscure Easter egg or two in it. Yeah, there will be a background character, a, a sign, something. Yeah, I've used those sites and sat there as I was reading these to get every single little reference he does. Well, you have to either be a genius or an idiot to attempt what this movie does. And I never thought this sounded like the stuff of a major motion picture blockbuster. That they are going to throw in Alan Quartermain, Tom Sawyer, Captain Nemo, the girl from Dracula, an invisible man, all of this stuff into a pool and think it would congeal. I mean, that's some tricky stuff. I wanted to know if it ever worked on the page. It does work on the page. I strongly recommend reading those if you like Alan Moore, especially the stuff he did with America's Best, Volumes 1, 2, and The Black Dossier. A lot of fun, good reads. Okay, I will definitely have to pick it up. But we're not here to talk about the book. We're here to talk about this movie. And I will say, you're you're questioning th this idea. I mean, Universal just tried to do this again with Dracula and Told, and they were going to kick off the Monster Avengers, basically. They still are, actually. The Monsters Avengers is coming. They're still going with that, okay. Yeah, Tom Cruise is doing it with The Mummy. That's the kickoff now. Yeah, but they tried it with Van Helsing and Hugh Jackman. and Oh, yeah, it's yet to take off yet, but they, they keep going. But this film, you ask if it was good on the comic, but what was happening is the producers were involved with America's Best Comics and found out that Alan Moore wanted to write this. They had this option for a movie, and this was in development before the first issue ever hit stands. Well, I, I, that kind of surprises me because I know James Robinson, who's a comic book writer, he was involved in the writing of this film, but there are a lot of similarities between the movie plot and the first volume's plot. Like, it's not a total departure. James Robinson was brought in to fix the mess the previous screenwriter ah. had made. <laughs> they spent like a year working with another screenwriter who was unnamed, trying to work this story out, and he just didn't get it. And so they brought in this comic book writer who they thought got the spirit better and was able to put this draft together. And thus the film we have, which... I was curious, the stuff I read is it differed from the comic in quite a few ways. 20th Century Fox insisted, foot to gravel, that there must be an American. Yeah, Tom Sawyer here, who is not a part of the original League. Again, with, with that world, Tom Sawyer could be in it, because it's any literary character, any pop culture character. But yeah, they did Americanize this film. I, I remember hearing that, like, we gotta have an American. So, we don't know here in the States who have Alan Quartermain or Dracula is, apparently, or the Invisible Man. So we gotta have Tom Sawyer. Well, I must admit, I know Alan Quartermain as being the ripoff of Raiders from the Lost Ark <laughs> that Richard Chamberlain and Sharon Stone starred in for two terrible movies from Canon Film. But I didn't know this literary character. And I do think it's just ballsy to take books that are well over 100, 150 years old. No, Hollywood loves that. Copyrights expired. <laughs> no, but to throw them all in a cauldron and reference them like we would know what that is. I mean, I remember when Tarantino was making references to the 1930s and 40s movies in Inglorious Bastards, and keeping up with that felt like a challenge. Uh, to ask mainstream audiences to be aware of all of these characters, I never saw this as a big blockbuster bonanza. To me, this sounds like a quirky art movie. This sounds like something that would be like City of Lost Children or, you know, Terry Gilliam or something. Just something small and weird and certainly eye-catching steampunk. But I just never saw it as an action movie. And what we're talking about today is, yes, Arnie, as you pointed out, the follow-up to Blade for Stephen Norrington. He did some other stuff in between, but Blade was his directorial debut. He did something called The Last Minute in between. Okay. I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying nobody paid attention. I hadn't heard of it until I was looking up what else he had done. But Blade really began his directorial career with it being such a hit and a fan favorite. Leave Extraordinary Gentlemen 
ended it, whether it's voluntarily or not. He has said that after working on this, just in the final stages of post-production, his experience on this film made him never want to work on film again. Sean Connery <laughs> said the same thing. Well, here's the thing with Sean Connery, and I don't know how much of this is, is Hollywood lore or what, but I uh, the story I've heard, the reason Sean Connery is in this film, he was offered Morpheus in the matrix and he's like well I, i'm not even gonna try a sean connery impression but like what the hell this doesn't make any sense no he was offered dumbledore he was offered gandalf he, wizards no i don't want it Th these are awful and they all became hits and so he's like look obviously i don't know what i'm doing i'm just gonna take the next script so that's <laughs> the story i've heard why he ends up in this film it's like this came across and he's like i don't know whatever it, it's supposed to be a big hit i'll take it no it's true you, if you watch the bonus features on the dvd sean connery literally says that they ask him why did you do this movie he said i didn't understand it but because <laughs> i didn't understand these other ones i figured i was wasn't going to let this one go. He didn't just take the next thing that came across. He took the next thing he didn't understand. <laughs> <laughs> and apparently no one else did either. But you know what? People have always struggled with steampunk. Has there ever been a hit... I mean, I just feel like it's not something for the mainstream. The idea that you're going to go back and do a retro future in which we have things from the past merge with technologies of the future that never existed. I mean, I love the idea of taking a hot air balloon to the moon. I mean, I saw Wild Wild West with oh. Will, Will Smith. I saw Sky Captain, World of Tomorrow. Uh, you know, I even feel like the Sean Connery Avengers had some of these elements here where they, yeah, it's camp and it tends to lose its way is what I've noticed is they never know how far to push the strangeness of it. And ultimately, as in the case of the movie we're talking about tonight, it can go pretty far away from anything that seems grounded or understandable for a mainstream audience. And Stuart, what you are to animation, I am to steampunk. That's because you go to conventions and you have to endure all those cosplayers. Actually, I like some of the cosplay stuff, but I've seen Wild Wild West. I've seen <laughs> some of the TV series they did. Briscoe County was kind of like that, as I recall. It's just, I prefer stories like the original H.G. Wells stuff that was steampunk for its day, or as it was called then, like science fiction. <laughs> yes. Versus trying to tell a retro story with futuristic accoutrement. And that's how this world works, at least in the comics. Like, the first volume, they're trying to make airships, and they're trying to get some chemical from some H.G. Wells novel about going to the moon that they used to fly to the moon. Here, though, in this film, it feels like, oh, we gotta make it more grounded, so we gotta have this weird, like, car we're gonna see, and mm. the Nautilus is... It, yeah, it feels like uh, uh, on one hand they want it steampunk, but on the other hand they want it grounded in reality. And I just I don't know how well that meshes together. Yeah, it's it's always a struggle for any filmmaker and for the audience. I feel like Arnie, your perspective is one that many people do share. They just don't get it. They don't want to get it. But I like it. I just think from a design standpoint, it's very beautiful to look at a world like that. And I do like it in cosplay. I like it in art. It's just never a good story that is related to it, at least that I have found. Yeah, I'm waiting for the masterpiece. I'm waiting for the one to really show the world how good it can be. Yeah, you're still waiting. <laughs> yeah, it's not this film, but I will also say that I have seen this movie once before, and I didn't remember hating it as much as everyone else hated it. Yeah, this film has a horrible reputation, and I'm the same with you, Stuart. I, I saw it expecting the worst. It wasn't the worst. I don't get its reputation. I was out of the country the summer this came out, so I had no idea when it came out, how the reviews were, the box office. It looks like it was very poor. I saw it on video months and months later and just remember thinking that it was a very odd bird. I actually saw this during its theatrical run. We have a drive-in that does double features in my town, and it's a sometimes a fun night just to go out and get two movies real cheap, and... The double feature this night was a one-two punch. League of Extraordinary Gentlemen let it off. Yeah, what did they team this up with? Hollywood Homicide Ooh. was the second one that I saw. 
Starring another actor that always picks bad projects, Harrison Ford. Okay. Oh, I thought you were going to talk about his co-star, Josh Hartnett. Oh, no. No, he can't get into a good movie, but (laughs) Harrison Ford could. He just chooses not to. I remember that at that point, I think it was Mars. It might have been Venus. We were having some celestial thing where you could see another planet clearly visible in the sky. It was so much more interesting than League of Extraordinary (laughs) Gentlemen. I spent the whole time looking out my convertible window at a planet waiting for Hollywood Homicide. This movie was so bad, it made Hollywood Homicide look good in comparison. 